I love where we are heading this morning, but to, to get where we're going to land is going to be a, a little bit of work, and so I am hopeful that, um, uh, that you'll stick with me here. Uh, one of the things we see is uh, a little bit of, of hide-and-seek uh, from Adam and Eve. Uh, we've all probably played hide-and-seek at some point in time. Uh, I remember playing it a lot growing up, and that's why I went in the Marine Corps, so I can continue to play hide-and-seek. We don't call it that, um, but uh, uh, we, uh, we, we learn, uh, as, as you get older, you learn how to hide better, uh, and uh, well, we see a whole lot of that this morning out of chapter 3, but here's where we're going. What we see out of, of chapter 3, we, we've been, everything in chapters 1 and 2, God created everything is beautiful, and then in chapter 3, there is this massive shift that happens in chapter 3, and it's the entrance, uh, for the first time, the entrance of sin. We have temptation and falling to temptation and sin, and from that, what we see this morning out of uh, verses 8 through 10 is, is really really is the, the first fallout of sin, of giving in into, giving into temptation. What, what, what does it look like? What happens when there's a fallout uh, and giving in to temptation? And so we want to hang out there for a little bit, but what is going to be so important for us as we come out of that, that isn't where we want to hang out. We want to see, if it's like, oh man, talk about the results of sin, ugh. But where we're going to come out is we're going to get this picture of God uh, that is critically important for us. And the more that we can understand the fallout of sin and the effects of sin and we feel the weight of that, the greater what God is going to look like and what it's going to mean for us. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. What we're going to see as well next week when we come back to this, God willing, uh, when we come back is uh, what we'll call the blame game. Uh, and it is all about taking responsibility. So the second result of fallout of sin is the blame game. And, uh, and so we point our finger in other directions. And so we're going to be talking about taking responsibility. We're going to be talking about husbands. So wives, make sure your husbands are here. And, uh, and all kinds of what does it mean when somebody sins against you? How do you respond when somebody sins against you? What does that look like? And so we'll dive into that more next week. What we've been learning in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 3 is the strategy of Satan. That Satan comes and he tempts, he, he wants us to sin, and remember sin is when I build my own kingdom. I, I want to uh, have wisdom, I want to be like God, I want to build my own kingdom apart from God. So I'm going to step out of doing what God has said and what God has commanded, and I'm going to do my own thing. And so that's sin. And so Satan, his strategy is to get us to sin and to uh, try to uh, defile the glory of God. And so we see that in verses 1 through 5, and then in verses 6 and 7, we see how easy it is to fall to temptation. We see Eve and Adam diving into their sin and diving into the abyss and, uh, and this desire to rule on their own. As we work through our chapter, we see the fallout of sin, and again, it's, this, is, this is hard, hard stuff, but it's real. And it uh, impacts us personally. Let me read for us the first 13 verses of chapter 3. So we have the context of where we're going. So hopefully you've already turned there. Genesis chapter 3. And here we are, verse 1. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, 
God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, the woman you gave me gave to be with me. She gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. (laughs) I am looking forward to diving into those verses. Um, uh, did you notice what Adam says? Uh, wasn't me, God. It was the woman that you gave me. She's the one that made me. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get there next week. Um, and then she's like, no, no, it was the serpent, uh, not me. It was the serpent. Um, yeah. All right, so what do we see in verses 8, 9, and 10? That's where we want to focus this morning. In verses 8 through 10, what do we see that Adam and Eve are doing? Let me read for us again verses 8 through 10. Then the the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So what are Adam and Eve doing when God shows up? Hiding. Hiding. Good. Yeah, they're hiding. Why do we want to slow down and pause and look at that? Why is that important for us to know? What what difference does it make? Here's why this is why we want to slow down. Because this is our story. This is your story and mine. This is what we do. Um, For example, have you ever wondered why God feels so far away? Why does he feel so distant? Ever wonder why you feel shame? Why, Why do you feel like you need to compare yourself to others in the room? Why, Why do you feel like you don't measure up? Why do, you, why do you hide and, and, and not want anybody else to know your dirt? Ever wonder why you are a different person on social media than you are in real life? You see, this is, this is our story. In other words, we do the same things that they did here in the beginning. We do the same things, the same kind of of hiding that goes on. What Adam and Eve are doing is, it tells us a number of times here, they hide, they hid. What are they experiencing when when they go to hide? They're experiencing what we would call shame. 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 And... And it's such a, here's why this is significant. It's such a sad commentary. This is an incredibly sad commentary because they hide from God. They, they try to hide from the presence of God. What's significant with that is that there had always been joy 
when God shows up. When, when, when God comes onto the scene, there's, there's joy, there's excitement. But now, um, I had a little bit of a picture of the joy. Uh, uh, just recently, our, our daughter and grandchildren, uh, our two grandkids, we have a, a, a grandson uh, named Nehemiah. We call him Nehi. He's three and a half. And uh, we have a granddaughter, Noel, and she's 18 months. And uh, when, they, when they flew in, we picked them up at the airport. And I hadn't seen, uh, hadn't seen them for a little bit. And so when Nehi sees me, he, he yells, Pappy! And he goes running towards me, and he flies. He takes takes his little giant leap and he jumps up and I catch him and I just, he gives me this giant three-year-old bear hug as big as he can. I just hold him and he just clings to me. He was so excited to see me. It was those moments like, wow, this is, what a treasure. Every time in Genesis, all throughout, whenever God shows up, there is an excitement there is a joy, there is a unity, there is this, this beauty that comes, yes, for the first time. It's different in these verses. There is shame, a need to, to, to hide. There, there is no mediator. There's never been a need for a mediator for the first time, God was a tear to Adam and Eve. They'd never experienced that before. They were afraid. There was fear. That they had lost the, the, the blessed blindness, innocence of ignorance, uh, the things they didn't know. Uh, I would say maybe the, the beauty of naivety. That they knew nothing of nakedness prior to this moment. So they hide themselves. They, 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 they hide and, and nothing has really changed. <laughs> we, we, we still attempt to hide. We, we, we feel shame when sin, sin enters into our world. When we sin, we feel shame, or at least we should feel something. We'll, we'll get there in a moment. Shame. It's what they're experiencing. And, and so you step into the scene. You, you, you step into the garden and, and take a look at what's going on, and you see that they are, are hiding. They're, they are trying to cover up self-protection. Put, put a wall around. Uh, I don't want to be seen. Uh, there's a feeling of being exposed. It's all the telltale signs of shame. Shame is this, this need to cover up. This, uh, there's, a, there's a distancing that happens and, and, and relationships with others suffer when, when one is feeling shame. Uh, it is a feeling, when, when one is feeling shame, you f have a sense of feeling that you are unacceptable. I'm unacceptable. And, and, it, and it separates from, from community. Ed Welch rightly gives some descriptors to uh, shame. Words like discarded, a stranger, alone, orphaned, not belonging. Those are the few words that are carried by the image of shame. He goes on, shame is being exposed, exiled, and unclean. Unclean means that, like nakedness, you are unpresentable. 
But the problem goes deeper than a need for mere covering. Instead, you are dirty, defiled, unworthy. You, you, you feel vile and, and disgusting. Uh, heavy words. There's, um, in, in India, the, there is uh, the caste system, and the lowest Indian caste is the, the Dalit. And they are often known as the untouchables. Shame feels like being an untouchable. Something, so, something is, something's wrong with you. And, and you, you, can't be, you, you can't be around God and you, you, you can't be around, be around others in, in safety. You can't be the, the real you. It, you have a need to be, to be washed. You need to be covered. And, and so here in the garden, Adam and Eve are experiencing shame for their sin. They are... They are hiding. It, it is, it, it, it's like they, 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 they hear God coming, and, and so they, they go and they cover up, and they get into the corner, and they, 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 they hide, and it's, please, please, please don't, don't come near. I, I, I don't want you to see me like this. Just stay away. I, and there's this, this covering that that they are doing. It's, and, and in the midst of this, uh, shame will accumulate lies uh, about it. It's, uh, what are Adam and Eve thinking as they, as they, are, they are cowering, as they are hiding? What, are, what, what is crossing their minds? A sense of guilt? Embarrassed? feeling of, of being a failure, maybe worthless. Their, their, their conscience is, is alive and it lays them bare. David, the, the king, King David, the, the one who pins Psalm 23, falls into deep sin. If you read his account, he, he, he falls into this deep sin of, of adultery with Bathsheba, and he tries to cover up his sin by killing and murdering her husband, and then he tries to cover that up for nine months or so. He finally repents, and, and out of his repentance and the freedom that he feels, he, he reflects on that repentance and the experience of that, and he writes about sin and the effects of sin on him in Psalm 32. Uh, Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4 says this, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. It, it, it affected him, not just mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. He had, he had covered that up. He, he tried to hide. For, for Adam and Eve, what they have always experienced, delight, unity, trust, a beautiful thing. They experienced peace. And it's now shattered. It's shattered. And again, we, we get this. Sin enters in and, 
and, and there is brokenness in relationships, a, a brokenness of trust, a, a loss of peace, no, no unity, not being on the same page. And, and it happens in, in church, and it happens in the home. We, we get it. We're plagued by sin. And, and, and in a sense, when there is sin, there is something good about uh, our, our conscience is, is blaring sirens. It says something is off. Uh, we should feel something. In fact, I would say that is even a, a gift of God to feel something. Something's wrong. Uh, it's uh, that, that sense of shame and guilt can be a, a sense that there's, there's signals. The, the, the warning light that comes on your dashboard. Something's off. Some, something needs to be, what, what's going on here? What's, what's wrong here? So often we ignore those little dashboard indicators Ah, get to it. We'll, we'll finally get to it. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Yeah, I should probably check on that. And we can even just completely ignore it. For those who feel no shame would be like those in Jeremiah 6 that where it says that the people didn't even know how to blush. They, they refused to feel any shame at all over their rebellion. We, we should feel something that is a, is a blessing because sin affects our deepest core. It it affects our lives and our relationship with God and with others and, and where, where, where sin is just left to, to fester, to continue, it, it begins to reek and it will destroy relationships. And, and, and it needs to be dealt with before the Lord, probably with others as well. And you'll find that once you, when you reconcile with God and you get the, the relationship with God right and there's confession, that you'll find that, that when you've dealt with that before God, your relationships will be much smoother as well. Um, some examples. Um, Joanne. Joanne had been dealing with porn, but she felt that deep need to hide. It's a personal problem. She found herself uh, quite depressed most nights, thumbing, thumbing through her, her phone and social media and just noticing she doesn't really have friends that invite her out. She doesn't have the same kind of life and just finds herself, she's going through, just finding herself depressed. And, and so eventually just finds herself into another porn site and hiding. And she feels the need to, remember I said that shame seems to accumulate lies. And so she hides all the more because isn't this after all a man's problem? And, and who's she going to be able to even tell this to? And but it continues to, to grow, finds yourself more and more in the sights. And, and, and as she does, she, she finds that she is distancing herself from, from those that she, she loves. There's this sense of shame. And so she tends to distance herself from friends and from 
church, and from God. And she, she hides. It's, it's, it's what's going on here. Clyde, for example. Clyde, he's been struggling with work and he's had all kinds of pressures and, and his relationships that are really close to him have not been going well. And so he finds himself at night just, uh, just drinking just a little bit more of a bottle of liquor. Over time, he just continues to go there night after night, but almost imperceptibly, he's been drinking more. And as he drinks more and more, he finishes off another bottle and feels that, that, that shame. And so he needs to, uh, to, to hide the bottles in the trash and hopefully his wife won't notice. His kids won't say anything. Nobody would have to know. And so he, so he hides and, and he pulls back more and more from, from friends. He, he doesn't spend time in God's word. He, he's, he's distancing himself from his small group and from others and, and ultimately he distances himself from God. He's hiding. He feels shame. And it's a shame that, that, that you will either, in, in shame, when you, that, that, that feeling comes, you either will go vertical and you'll bring that before God, or you'll go internal and you try to cover. You, you, you sew fig leaves together. You, you do your own thing try to cover up and, and, and fill that, that need for cleansing. And no, don't, don't lose me here. I, I, I want to show you, I want to show you the best part of the text here. We've, we've spent some time, and, and I get it, heavy time, to, to look at, at shame and, and sin and the effects of falling to sin, and, and I, I want you to, to feel the weight of that. The greater you feel that, the greater that this is going to look, the greater you're going to understand this, and, and so, so I want us to get this. We, we need to bring God into the picture, which is the, the hardest thing to do in, in the midst of sin. When there is sin, when there is sin, the hardest thing to do is to bring God into the picture. Again, we want to go internal. I want to hide. I feel the need to conceal to deceive. I feel the need to cover up and, and figure it out on my own. I mean, I can't bring God into this. What would God do? What is God going to say? And, and so we accumulate all kinds of lies. And so I want us to see right out of here what happens. The, the hardest thing to do is is to bring God into the picture, and, and, and we see this with Adam and Eve. Look for God in this story. What do we see? Verses 8 and 9. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? Take note. How does God come? How is God coming in the midst of this? He is not coming in fury. 
He's not coming in fury. There is a compassion. He is seeking an honest dialogue. He came walking to them. For the first time this week, I, as I, I try to place myself uh, in the garden and, and, and see the scene, what's going on here. For the first time this week, I was thinking, what would have happened if, if, if Adam and Eve in this moment stepped out and, and brought it all before God? What would God, how would God have responded in that moment? This is the new thought for me. I, God doesn't, he, he, God isn't saying, hey, how can you be so stupid? How many times, how many times have you felt like that's what God says to you? You hear it, don't you? How can you be so stupid? How many times? How many times? And that isn't all what God's doing. What does God say? Verse 9. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? This is a, a massively critical question. I remember playing hide and seek with my kids when they were uh, uh, super young. Uh, and uh, when, when they're really young, uh, they, they, they don't seem to catch the, the concept of hide and seek all that well. Uh, so you say, okay, you go hide and I'm going to count. And so they'd, we'd be out of the park and there'd be like a little tree that's maybe uh, two or three inches thick. And so they would go and they'd go and hide behind that and, and, and hope that, or even turn sideways, and hopefully that uh, you won't be seen. It's, it, it's obvious where they are. Just wide open. What is going on? Why is God asking, where are you? Is he's walking around the garden. He's like, I know they were here. What? Hey, Adam, where, where are you? I, I can't see you at all. I, I mean, is, is God confused here? <laughs> Is he deceived? It's like, oh, you got those, you, you got the fig leaves on. Man, it's like a ghillie suit. That's good. I can't see you at all. I, is he lost? Is God ignorant? He doesn't know where they are? What's, what's going on? In Job chapter 34, verse 22, it says this. There is no darkness no deep darkness where evildoers can hide. This question is not a question of location. Hey, where is your location? Hey, can you share with me uh, where you are and I'll come to you? He's not asking for a GPS location, a grid His question is, what is the state of your heart? Where is your heart? Where is your heart? This question, this question tells me that Adam and Eve are completely lost. without help, and that God is there to help. God knows. God knows exactly where they are. 
He is God Almighty. He is not, God is not like the elf on the shelf. You put the elf on the shelf, he's watching you. Got my eyes right on you and step out of line. That is not God. God is holy. God is righteous. He is omniscient. It's a big fancy word for all-knowing. He knows. He knows it all. He knows everything that's going on. He is God Almighty. He knows exactly where they are. So for instance, if you have been hiding. You have some secret sin that nobody but you know about. It's nobody but you and God. He knows. And the only reason, the only reason why it hasn't been revealed is because God has not yet revealed it. But he knows He has omnipotence, he is all-powerful, omniscience, all-knowing, and nothing is unknown to God. Sin is only hidden for as long as God allows. So what do we see God doing? What is God doing here in verse 8 and 9? I love this. You know what he's doing? He's taking the initiative. God is taking the initiative and stepping out to them. That's what God does. He takes the initiative. He moves toward them. In the midst of their sin... In the midst of, of, of what they are doing, he moves toward them. The need of a good shepherd to care. What does this tell us about God? Why do we spend so much time this morning talking about the fallout of sin and our sin in our lives and how it distances us from God and from others. Why hang out there? <laughs> because of this. What does this tell us about God? That God moves toward the shame and the guilty. He moves toward us. <laughs> it's, he, he is the the friend of sinners. Jesus, the Son of God, is known as the friend of sinners. I love what Ed Welch says on this. As Jesus, the Son of God, dwelt among us, the Son of God dwelt among us. He's with us. He moves toward us. He was the friend of sinners. Sinners meant the really bad or different people who are not like us. They, they included people who were known by their sins. Joe the divorcer. Jane the adulteress. Jim the thief. And they included those who were physically handicapped or abused. Jack, the blind. Jane, the molested. Sinners had everyone gossiping. But Jesus sought them out. And they sought him out. He was their friend. And, and, and he was happy to touch them. The unacceptable. The untouchables friend of sinners. What does this tell us about God? That God is not ashamed to be with you. 
Jesus is not ashamed to be associated with you. He is not ashamed to be associated with you. Shame has the tendency to to accumulate these lies that I need to go it alone. I got to figure this out on my my own my, by myself. I what I'm going to do? I have to cover up. I have to earn my way back into the community. Where, where the response, the, the response is humility, not humiliation, but humility. James says that God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. A humility. Dane Ortland in Gentle and Lowly rightly asks this. Whom do you perceive him to be in your sin and in your suffering? Who do you think God is? Not just on paper, but the kind of person you believe is hearing you when you pray. How does he feel about you? His saving is not cool and calculating. It is a matter of yearning. Not yearning for the Facebook you, the the you that you project to everyone around you. Not the you that you wish you were. He's yearning for the real you, the you underneath everything you present to others. Jesus is not ashamed to be associated with you. Oh, I I wish you would get that. Oh, I pray that you would get that. That he, he yearns, his heart is for you. The, the, the warning indicators on your dashboard are a gift of God and it's an invitation to come. It's for you. He yearns for you. I, I want you to get it, to get him. To, to, to know that he takes the initiative and moves toward you. You can't do it on your own. You can't cover up on your own. He, he, he comes toward you. He, he dwells among us. He initiates. So what do you do? Where do you go? You go somewhere when there's sin in your life. Where do you go? Do you turn internal? Do you try to cover up? Or do you turn to him? How do you answer God? If you're hiding... How's your hiding going? What would it mean for you to confess your sin to him? What would it mean for you to step out of concealment and trying to hide from God and to bring all the junk before God? What would that mean? Let me give you a little picture of what it looks like. You see, remember I was talking about David in Psalm 32 and how he, how he had just, he sinned just massively. And when he confesses before God the experience that he had, Psalm 32 says, how joyful is the one 
whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and who, in whose spirit is no deceit. How joyful is a person. Joyful is the one. I acknowledge my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. He felt the freedom that comes of stepping out of confession. Confessing his sin, he, he, he came to the Lord. Confession can, can maybe feel and, and seem like a little bit like it is a, uh, it's like taking medicine that just tastes terrible, but you know you should probably take. It makes you feel nauseous. But you got to get it down. That is not what God calls us to. What he calls us to is, is good for you and healing to your body. It is healing to your body and to your soul. Are you hiding? God asks the right question. Where are you? Where are you? Be the right question for us to, in our time, where are you? Oh, fine, that the Lord comes for sinners like you and me. Let's pray. You come. You initiate. It is, it is all seen through the, the gory, bloody cross. You took the, you took the steps. You moved toward the, the, the filthy, the, the untouchables, the, the worthless, the failures, the, the dirty ones like, like us, God. And, and you change us. You, you touch us. You, you take us in. You, you heal. You restore. You, you move. God, I, I know that there is a, there's numbers who have been concealing and, and hiding and trying to find it in, in, in themselves to fix the sin that they find themselves in. And Lord, I pray. Oh, Lord, I pray that there would be no more running from you but a stepping out because you are doing the work, God. God, I pray that there would be a freedom that's found. You'll touch. You'll heal. Lord, I pray there'll be a confession, a, a, a repenting of sin. We have much to, to learn about you. We've so many times felt like you will just thrash us. You will do what we do to ourselves. You will reject us. You will throw us out garbage heap. But your love is far more than that. It's, it's seen in, in, in your son, Jesus. Thank you. We turn to you. Help us walk in you. naked and unashamed before you, almighty God. It is in the powerful work that's been done through Christ.
Amen.